Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming again. I, I appreciate this platform. I, I've got to say, it is your platform, um, and I, I feel honored and responsible for sharing it. Let me say that at the start in case I offend people. Because this, this morning's talk is, starts with the stuff of dreams, which are not logical necessarily, are necessarily politically correct. So, you know, many years ago, I, I took a workshop at Roe Camp and Conference Center uh, from a Unitarian minister who'd written a book about using dreams in spirituality. You know, dreams are mysterious. You know, there is a lot of debate in the academic community about what dreams are in the brain, what part they have to do with our development, whether they mean anything at all. You know, some of them believe that your dreams are your brain breaking false connections. You know, you can't fly, you can't walk on water. Uh, and there is some support for the traditional interpretation that our dreams are messages from our subconscious, that our waking minds would censor, making fresh connections to teach us lessons. So this, you know, what I'm going to talk about now is the latter. So let me describe a dream. I know everybody hits here. People talk about their dreams, but give me a break. So let me tell you, I'm in this incredible place, kind of like a campus, sort of like the picture I just showed a little bit ago. And each building has a beautiful abstract sculpture in, in front of it. And, it, you know, dreams have these weird things in them. Um, and it's hard to describe, but if you could make a three-dimensional stained glass window that was kind of like a tree with branches and they're glowing and they're, instead of lead between the stained glass, there's silver and it's all lit up. They were like that and they were all over the place and they're scattered around town in front of these beautiful high-tech buildings, you know, and they're all connected by these very neat walkways. And I realize that I've been transported a hundred years into the future and Bernardston has become a big city or a kind of campus. Uh, I don't recognize anyone, but I do recognize our church. It's the same traditional building that's been occupied since 1739, except it has one of these sculptures in front of it, and there are a few cows grazing on the lawn. And on our announcement board, wait for it, is a big poster reading, Cow Lives Matter. Now this upsets me for a moment, thinking that if any black people go by the church, they're going to be insulted. But I realize that this is the year 2120, and luckily, that's, we've cured our racism problems and that, and we've moved on. And so instead of anti-racism protests 100 years from now, all of the UUs have become vegan and vegetarian activists. This is a dream. So this is when Gwyneth Paltrow walks up to me and takes my hand to guide me into the church. And inside, someone explains to me that she's not really Gwyneth Paltrow, but she's a robot that looks like her to make me feel comfortable. You know, they say, we thought you'd be lonely here, so we found the robot that looks most like your wife. Here I must digress and say that when I compliment Ellen's look, she sometimes says, I love it when you don't wear your glasses in the morning. Anyway, so it's coffee hour in 2120, and people guide me over to this big punch bowl filled with a mixture of granola, fruit loops, and milk. And I take a ladle of it, uh, but of course it's almond milk. It would be politically incorrect to have dairy products in a UU church that is preaching that cow lives matter. So I'm trying to avoid the Fruit Loops and dig for the granola when other people around me start having a furious debate. When one says, all animals matter, we shouldn't be focusing on just cows. And another person who in my dream looked something like Barack Obama says, that's not the point. It's only cows that are being ground up into hamburger for McDonald's. And at this point, I look out the window and I see there had been a McDonald's across the street from the church, but it has been burned down and the golden arches are like in the ashes. You know, anti-meat activists have destroyed McDonald's. So Gwyneth Paltrow turns to me and says, 
did Unitarians eat at McDonald's in your time? And I said, well, almost none did. And, and, and I stopped when I got older. And I was hoping that there were no ancient receipts from Burger King that, I'd, that they'd saved through the century. And, and this is where the dream takes one of those turns that only happen in dreams. I realize that I've been brought to the future to explain my time. And in this year 2120 or whatever it was, the UU General Assembly has met in Bernardston, which is now the capital of Massachusetts because Boston is under the ocean because of all the Antarctic melting. And so I'm, all of a sudden I'm in a huge arena full of 22nd century UUs, and this is some kind of inquisition or investigation. So I'm on stage with robot Gwyneth Paltrow, and she says, but you did eat a lot of, of meat back then, right? I said, well, yeah, almost everybody did. But there were vegans and vegetarians then, right? And I figured they'd research my family and know that uh, Ellen's kids were vegans. And, and sure, well, we, we did eat vegetarian sometimes. And I thought of the Boyden dairy farm at the end of our road, and I wondered if it was still in business or whether it had met the same fate as McDonald's. So I poked at my bowl of Fruit Loops and granola and wished it were real milk, but I decided I'd better put it down. Gwyneth smiled at me. It says in the records that you would preach here once a month. And I said, that's true. Grateful that somebody had remembered. How did you get to the church from your home in Conway, 25 miles away? At this point, she transforms into Leslie Stahl, and I realize this is kind of a 60 minutes ambush interview somehow taking place over space and time. I said, well, I drove, and the crowd gasped. But, but I drove a Prius, and we put solar panels on our house. Scattered, faint applause. Why didn't you drive a Tesla? And at this point, I noticed that Elon Musk is in the audience. Of course, he'd figure out a way to live forever. And I was about to ask him, well, how many gallons of fuel did it take to launch one of your cars into space? You know, you could have given me one, but it, I thought it would seem too defensive. So I just said, I couldn't afford a Tesla. They were like 100 grand, so only rich people drove them. So Leslie slash Gwyneth says, you could have ridden your bicycle to church, couldn't you? I would have had to wake up at five in the morning and pedal for hours, and I would have been exhausted by the time I got there, too exhausted to preach. And, and my bike has a flat tire. You know, well, that last fact, true in my waking life, has been bugging me for a while, so much so that Ellen just fixed it. Anyway, so groans, groans arose from the angry future Unitarians, and I know I'm losing the crowd. Gwyneth Paltrow is now in the front row, glaring disapprovingly. And I guess she's not going to take me back to wherever they're putting me tonight. And the grilling continues. Let's go back to the church for a minute, Leslie Stahl says. How many gallons of fuel oil did it take to heat the church in those days? And here I'm transforming into all souls. I said, about four and a half thousand gallons a year but you knew all about carbon emissions and climate change, right? Well, well, yeah, we did, and we were quite vocal about it. Still, you didn't insulate the ceiling and you didn't put solar panels on the roof of the bell tower, did you? We couldn't afford it. We could barely keep the church open as it was. The buildings were old and hard to insulate and the roof leaked. We couldn't afford a minister. Besides, with everything else in the society based on fossil fuel, it wouldn't have made a difference. We, we were opposed to systemic fo fossil fuel use, but at the time, we had to do what we did. At this point in the dream, there's a proposal on the floor of the General Assembly to acknowledge our church's historic complicity in the evils of meat eating and fossil fuel use. I slip off stage and somehow use my phone to call my wife, Ellen, and I tell her what's going on. Ellen is very sympathetic to the situation until I tell her about robot Gwyneth Paltrow when she says, you get back home right now. That's when I woke up. Well, there are two ways of interpreting this dream. 
One is that there are things that we know are true, things we know we should be doing with our lives, things that we don't do because we live in a society that doesn't see things our way. The other interpretation of the dream is that we should be cautious about judging our ancestors without understanding the times that they lived in. The past few months have brought America to a new threshold of racial justice. We're breaking through to a greater understanding of how white supremacy culture has held black people down even after the legal changes brought about during the civil rights era, thanks to brave people like the late John Lewis. Such societal breakthroughs don't happen entirely peacefully. Jefferson once said that the tree of liberty needs to be refreshed every few decades with the blood of patriots. Thankfully, it seems that in modern times, it needs to be refreshed with a few broken store windows and toppled shibboleths. Statues are being pulled down by angry mobs who've drawn the connection between Confederate generals who fought to preserve the institution of slavery and the extrajudicial executions of black people like we saw in Minneapolis with George Floyd. The Stars and Bars flag has been banned from NASCAR and taken off the flag of Mississippi. It's no longer a sign of the nobility and bravery of the South, but of its shame. And it's about time too. In the current revision of our history, there are contexts so we might dismiss too easily. Human affairs are complicated and the evils of the past are interwoven with ours. Hindsight is 2020. We see the past through modern eyes, just as the future will look at our shortcomings and failures through their eyes. Perhaps our great great grandchildren will scorn us for our carnivorous way. You know, how could you have walked by the meat counter at Big Y without being disgusted? How come we didn't blockade the drive ins at McDonald's? Now, I'm no vegetarian, far from it. I eat steak and chicken and dairy food and eggs. And the reasons why I do are for another time. But I, I can see some logic in the vegan, vegetarian, I don't know, vision of the future. And I use this analogy as an example of something that is broadly accepted now that perhaps in the future will be seen as unacceptable, even evil. Now, have you ever heard the word speciesist? A speciesist is a person who believes that human beings are inherently, inarguably, better than all other life forms, and we can do with them what we like. And this is related, I believe, to the theological term dominionism. We might think of this attitude that most of humanity shares and takes as a given, you might call it human supremacy culture. Unless you think I'm trivializing Black Lives Matter and, that our, and our denomination's ongoing battle against white supremacy culture, I'm not. I'm trying to illustrate how deeply it's rooted. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the idea that races other than your own are basically the same as you was a fringe idea. It, you know, it was perfectly okay to steal land from native people and kidnap them, to work in your fields or on your ships. It wasn't even seen as stealing. It was manifest destiny. Now, the, the vegetarians and vegans among us today who see all sentient life as inherently valuable, capable of emotion and pleasure and pain, right now they're a minority among us, and the rest of us, myself include, could have our hamburgers and drumsticks with only minor qualms about cage-free eggs and kosher beef, because that's the world we were born into. My point is that all centuries have their context. We can judge the context, but we should be careful of judging the people. Which brings me to Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, author of the Declaration of Independence, who was also a slaveholder, and some say, slave rapist. One of his descendants wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a few weeks ago proposing that the Jefferson Memorial in Washington should be modified, replacing his statue with someone else, perhaps Sojourner Truth. 
And he said that Monticello, built by enslaved people under Jefferson's direction, was monument enough with its slave cabins and the small room for Sally Hemings, by whom evidence says he fathered six children. Now, Jefferson certainly benefited from white male privilege. He inherited slaves and land from his father, and his wife gave him even more, including the family, uh, the Hemings family, which included Sally, who was his wife's half-sister. And by the end of his life, he had controlled about 600 slaves, and only the Hemings children were set free, as was Sally. And the rest were sold to pay Jefferson's death, debts after his death, because he was about $2 million in today's money in debt. And this would be a blot on Jefferson's legacy. In contrast to George Washington, who was another Virginia wealthy white male slaveholder who freed all the enslaved people in his will. Now, was the man who wrote, all men are created equal, a hypocrite? Was he a racist? Yes, by today's standards. But what about the standards of the 18th century into which he was born? By those standards, you might see him as a pragmatic radical. And there's a lot to think about before we tear down the Jefferson Memorial in our zeal. When Jefferson was a young man just out of law school, he, he was elected to the Virginia State House, the House of Burgesses. He hadn't married or moved to Monticello yet. His head was filled with the Enlightenment ideas taught by his tutors at William and Mary. So he proposed a bill in the legislature to end the importation of Africans to Virginia. It did not go well for Jefferson. He was rebuffed by his colleagues and he learned the limits of idealism. If you don't have power, you can't change things. If Jefferson had stuck to his guns, he never would have been the author of the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, his first draft of the Declaration included a whole paragraph blaming King George for the slave trade, and he called it an, an execrable commerce and an assemblage of horrors. And Jefferson blamed the deletion of this paragraph on delegates to Congress from South Carolina, Georgia, and the Northern delegates who profited from the slave trade. Now, after the revolution, Jefferson drafted a law that would prevent slavery from being extended to the new states that was defeated by one vote. And when he became president, and in 1805, the first year it would be legal to do so under the Constitution, he finally was able to ban the transatlantic slave trade, which he had been trying to do since his late 20s. Politics is the art of the possible, and Jefferson, I think maybe this was the point of my dream, Jefferson would have been no more able to abolish slavery in his time than I'm able to ride my bicycle everywhere instead of driving a car. You know, equality is something, is an ideal that we take for granted today, partially due to the work of people like Jefferson. But in the 18th century, the equality of all people was seen as irrational. You know, the idea that average working men should vote, that was way off on the fringes. As for women, Forget about voting or holding public office. They were legally the property of their husbands. They had no, weren't allowed to have bank accounts, property titles. They had no right to divorce or leave their partners. In most of Europe and Ireland, the majority of people were serfs, little more than slaves. They may have been legally allowed to move from place to place, but few had the means to do so. My Irish ancestors were tied down to their little stone-walled enclosures by their English landlords. That was the world in 1776 when Jefferson wrote that it was self-evident that all men are created equal. And that was a bombshell that led to the more complete equality we have today. That's why Jefferson's statue is on the mall, along with Lincoln's and Martin Luther King's. Not because he was perfect, not because he didn't benefit from the labors of enslaved human beings, but that's only one lesson from my dream or nightmare of being prosecuted for my carnivorous gas guzzling ways. Here's the other lesson of the dream, which is probably more important. Let me read you something that a man named Eric Levitz wrote in New York Magazine. 
I think about a week ago. He said, Americans live in a society that warehouses more than 2 million people in penitentiaries rife with state-ordered tortured and unpunished sexual abuse. A society that lives off the essential labor of workers who have no right to vote and whom the state reserves the right to deport. A society that allows hundreds of thousands of its people to go homeless, millions of its children to go hungry, while dozens of its Fortune 500 companies go untaxed. A society that condemned much of its black population to enslavement for 246 years and for, to Jim Crow rule for a century after that, and over underinvestment, underemployment, and over-incarceration ever since. A society that abets the war crimes of Islamist autocracies, collectively punishes the populations of adversarial regimes, think Venezuela and Cuba, and undermines global action on an ever-deepening climate crisis that threatens the global poor with mass displacement, if not mass death. Paris Accord. Quite a litany. None of these things are new to you or to me. These are the crimes of our times, and we've lived under the propaganda that aggressive policing and throwing lots of people into prison is the way to keep society safe. And we've accepted this idea despite mountains of evidence that our criminal justice system is prejudiced, unfair, ineffective at changing the lives of inmates and less effective than available alternatives. So how shall we judge our ancestors who lived under the plantation propaganda that slavery was the natural state of affairs? It's essential to the economy. It's sanctioned by the Bible and that the free enslaved people would result in a race war. All of those were dire predictions of the pre-Civil War era that turned out to be patently false. I note that none of our right-wing friends would trade the economy we have now for the antebellum economy gone with the wind, notwithstanding. It's also important to notice that if all the freed African Americans had been deported after emancipation, as many people thought would have to happen, that our country would be immeasurably weaker culturally, economically, and spiritually. It's not a privilege to not have a cop's knee on your neck. It's not a privilege not to be shot in the back by a law officer for an insignificant crime or to be separated from your children. It's a right, a right that extends to every human being in this country. Things are, things are turning in the world thanks to a pandemic that's made us realize what fools we've been played for thanks to a government that's been captured by a mob with limited imagination and awareness, and thanks to video cameras that pull back the cloak of fascism and show us the ugly face of racism. We don't get many chances like this. And a lot of mistakes are being made, one of which I think is the meme, all cops are bad, when no one has the right to say all anybody's are bad, but that's another sermon. Someday, providing we don't completely screw up the planet with pollution or a nuclear war, people will look back on us and wonder why we did what we did, why we didn't change the world of, in light of what we knew in our hearts to be true. The first verse of one of our hymns says, The star of truth but dimly shines behind the veiling clouds of night. But every searching eye divines some partial glimmer of its life. Thomas Jefferson only saw a partial glimmer of the truth, as do we. We're disappointed in him. Will the future be disappointed in us? Thanks to my crazy dream, I'm thinking we need to go a little bit easier on people from the past and a little bit harder on ourselves. I, for one, don't want to face down that disapproving look from a robot that looks like Gwyneth Paltrow. And on that note, let's sing a hymn here. <laughs> 